Exodus chapter 3, we're going to read verses 1 through 15, and then uh, we're going to look at three questions about service. Three questions about service this morning. Go for it. So, Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flocks to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight. Why the bush is not burned? When the Lord saw that he, t- he turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush. Moses, Moses, he said, here am I. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you're standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their suffering, and have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Pezzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. I'm pretty sure the termites are in there too. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel had come to me, and I have also seen the oppression for which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you, and this shall be a sign for you that I have sent you, that when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel they will, and say to them, The God of your fathers has come and sent me to you, they will ask me, What is his name? What shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, The Lord God, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, for I am remembered throughout all generations. You know, when we think of Moses, many times when we think of Moses, we think of the mighty man of God standing on the mountain, holding the Ten Commandments, or maybe you imagine him with his rod held out over the Red Sea. And the sea is parting before him. And we see this mighty man of God who has got it all figured out, right? I mean, he knows where he's going. He knows what he's doing. He's confident in what he's doing. And man, this is the leader, leader, and everybody's going to follow him, right? I mean, that's how we view Moses. But Moses didn't start that way. Remember, why is Moses out in the wilderness to start with? If you remember your Israeli history, You go back a little ways, and Moses was taken into Pharaoh's household, wasn't he? He was floated down a river. He was captured by some Egyptians. His mom got to raise him underneath Egyptian rule. He had everything, wealth and notoriety, position. And one day he was out watching the children of Israel work as slaves, his own people. And uh, he takes on a taskmaster, doesn't he? He sees a taskmaster beating one of the children of Israel And he goes to that taskmaster and he kills him. And immediately Moses flees into the wilderness out of fear. He knew what was going to happen to him. And now he's been out in his comfort zone, right? Out in the wilderness, herding sheep for 40 years. And he's out there doing what he's always been doing. And all of a sudden there's this bush that's on fire, but it's not being consumed. Look again at verses 1 and 2 with me. It says, Now when Moses was tending the flock of Jethro... His father-in-law, the priest of Midian, he led the flock back to the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Did you catch in the text too where it says that he will return to that mountain later on? When Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he knew exactly where he was going. He knew exactly where he was going to lead them to, the mountain of God. And what was it on the mountain of God that he eventually would get? Ten Commandments. A word from the Lord. So not only did he see God in a burning fiery uh, bush here, but then he also gets to see God's backside of his glory again 
when he receives the Ten Commandments. And we often forget that these experiences are all working together to build up Moses into the man that he becomes. But this morning, I want to look at the three questions. The three questions, and then we're done, that Moses asked God. And God gave three distinct answers to Moses for what he should do. And the first one is found in verse 11. And look with me at verse 11 and what it says. It says this, But Moses said to God, Who am I? Who am I that I should go back to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh anything? God, have you not remembered who I am? Don't you know what I did? Don't you think they'll remember 40 years ago that guy that was named Moses who killed that guy? Yeah, remember him? Yeah, I'm him 40 years later, but hey, don't remember any of that stuff, okay? So Moses is like, there's no way I'm going back there. And if I go back there, what guarantee do I have that I'm going to be safe? And as I was studying this passage of scripture a few weeks ago, we're in the midst of that COVID-19 epidemic. And, and I wonder how many times God is asking some of us to step out of our comfort zones during this time and reach out to people around us to lead them out of the world and into Jesus Christ. And as we're going out in the world and, and God is moving us to do this, how many times do we ask the question, who am I? Who am I? God, I'm not a pastor. I'm not, I'm not somebody who knows the Bible really well. Who am I that you would use me to do this great thing for you? And I love how God answers the question. The first question he says, who am I? He doesn't feel qualified. He feels like God's picked the wrong leader. He doesn't think that he is the one that's able to do it. But then you've got to remember, what does 2 Corinthians 5.17 say? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things pass away, and behold, all things are new. God's saying, Moses, you're looking at trying to depend on your own strength. I'm trying to do something new. I'm going to deliver the children of Israel under your leadership. And Moses says, I'm not qualified. And God says, perfect. That's where I want you. Does it ever occur to you, God isn't looking for you to be all put together. He just wants you to be willing. God doesn't want you to do the work. He wants to do the work through you for his glory. See, if you do it, who takes credit? I do. But if God does it through me, what can I say? Hey, don't, it wasn't me. It was God. Praise the Lord. Moses says, I'm not the leader that can do this. I'm not the one that can bring them out of Egypt. By the way, the worst thing that the devil could ever hear is this. The devil dreads nothing more than his worst nightmare is this idea that you will discover who you are in Jesus Christ and then he has no influence over you. If you truly find out who you are in Jesus Christ, the devil will have no influence over you. How confident do you think Moses was when he threw his staff on the ground and his staff ate the three other staffs in the form of a snake? Remember that? He's standing in front of Pharaoh and he says, let my people go. And, and uh, the magicians that Pharaoh has, he throws their rods down. They turn into three snakes. Moses takes his rod, throws it down, turns into one snake. And who wins? Moses' snake eats the other three snakes. Then Moses reaches down, picks up his rod and holds it again. What would you be thinking at that moment? His God's a little bigger than my God, Right? And that's what God is saying. Don't you think you got to do it all, Moses? I want to do it through you. And you know, the secret to the successful Christian life is not that you got yourself all together. Because here's the reality. You don't. You never will. And if you're waiting for all your stuff to be together to serve God, then I got news for you. You're never going to serve him. But if you say, Lord, use me where I am. Lord, I'm willing. Here am I. Use me. What do you think God will do? God says, as soon as you get out of the way, I will get in the way. Um, when we struggle with who we are, when we struggle with our own insecurities, we will never help other people. Let me say that again. When we're struggling with our own insecurities, when we're struggling with our own ineptness, we will never help other people. Why? Because all our focus is on us. When we get our eyes off ourselves, then we can help other people. And Moses is saying, God, I can't, I can't, I can't. 
And eventually, if you know the rest of the story, you read on. He not only says that he can't, but he won't because he's not a great speaker. And God says, here's Aaron, now what's your excuse? And God, over and over again, throughout the Bible, whenever you see God's men saying, I can't do this, God says, great, that's where I want you to be. And the quicker we can get to, I can't, then God says, I will. I think Jeremiah 29, 11 is great for this. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not evil, plans for good and not evil, to give you a future and a hope. How many people in our world today are looking for hope? How many people in our world today are looking for meaning to life? How many people in our world today are looking for a purpose and a plan that's spelled out for them? And uh, I see this in our own culture today where people are looking for purpose. You know what? They want to know whose lives matter, don't they? Is it white? Is it black? Is it orange? Is it purple? You know what? Every life matters. And every life without Jesus Christ is a life that's spending eternity in hell today. And I hope that breaks our heart. I hope that helps us to see the mission that's out there. God hasn't called churches to be big and huge and sing great songs. He's called them to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And as you're going into the world preaching the gospel, then get together and encourage one another. Because as you go out into the world, you're going to see discouraging things. How many have seen discouraging things in the world lately? right? There's problems all around us. There's issues all around us. And you could take any point in history and look at history and you will find problems. Do you think the Roman Empire struggled with homosexuality? Yeah, it was there. Do you think they struggled with different nationalities not being respected? Yeah. Do you think in the time of World War II there was racial profiling? You know, these things are as old as man. We can go back in history and see these social problems, these economic problems that are relevant in our world today. We're just as relevant in other times, but the difference is, how did they handle them? And when a nation turns their eyes to Jesus Christ, when a person turns their eyes to Jesus Christ and says, God, we can't fix this. You know what God says? Great! Because I'm ready to fix it for you. I'm ready to do it for you. Listen to Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5. I love what he tells Jeremiah here. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you and appointed you to be a prophet to the nations. How much say did Jeremiah have in that? Stop and think about that. If you ever wondered about the sovereignty of God, Jeremiah 1 5 should nail it for you. Before you were born. How many decisions have you made before you were born? You know? Um, we didn't even get to pick the time we came out. That wasn't even God ordained. And uh, so I love Jeremiah 1.5 because it's a verse that reminds me, we're not in control of this world. We don't even have... We, we, before I formed you in the womb, I knew who you were. How, how do you beat that? Well, God, let me tell you what's going on in my life right now. You ever prayed that way? And God's up in heaven doing what? Duh. I knew that before you did. You're not telling me anything new. By the way, why do we pray then? Why do we pray? If God is omniscient, why do we pray? You know what prayer is to a Christian? It's us humbling ourselves before God and giving recognition to his all-powerful being. It's us submitting ourselves to God and giving recognition that he's all-powerful. Why do we ask for things from God? Because he can do it. So, how did God respond? Moses said, who am I? And God said this, it doesn't matter who you are, I am with you. I am with you. Look at verse 12. He said, but I will be with you and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Well, what did he carry up on that, carry down from that mountain that day? The Ten Commandments. That's pretty good, right? Exodus 20. You can go check that out. Moses felt a lack of intimacy. He felt a lack of understanding who God is and being a leader. He lacked conviction. He lacked 
the relationship with God that he needed to move forward for God's glory. But number two, look at the second question he asked. It's found in verse 14 and 15. He asked this question, what am I supposed to do? What am I called to do, God? All right, who am I? And God says, well, I'm with you. That's who you are. I'm with you. I'm going to do it through you. Second question is this. What am I called to do? Look with me at verse 14 again. He says, God said to Moses, who am I? Or God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the children of Israel. I am a sent you. And God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel. The Lord your God, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. You know, have you ever noticed when God gets involved in something, you better look out? Think about this in the Bible. Listen to all the things. When we allow God to be part of our life, God takes over a lot of things. When God gets in a thing, it's never the same. Sometimes it scares people. Sometimes, like Moses, had never seen his rod become a snake before. Do you think that kind of surprised him? When God got in a rock, a river flowed out of it and quenched the thirst of over 3 million people. Think about that. In a desert, by by the way, right? When God got in a donkey, what happened? Balaam got some news, didn't he? When God got in an axe head of iron, he caused it not only to float, but to swim on top of the water so the prophet could reach out his hand and touch it. How many of you have ever dropped something metal in the water and seen it float back to you? Uh, When God got in a little pot of oil, he caused it to multiply until every need was met with an abundance overflowing. When God got in a box they called the Ark of the Covenant, they placed this box in the holy place of the tabernacle And it became the presence of God with man. Today God has chosen to place his presence and glory. Not in a tent that the Israelites carry around. But in a tent called your body. The temple of the Holy Spirit of God. Your body is the temple of God. Your body is the dwelling place of God today in our world. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says this. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. That the excellency of power may be of God and not of us. It belongs to God and not to us. So God's answer to question number two. Moses said, what am I called to do? God says, hey, don't worry about it. Let me work through you. You're called to lead the children of Israel. That's it. That's all you need to know. How'd you like that job description? Kind of looks like a pastor's job description in in a church constitution. The pastor will do all things involved with church. He'll oversee all things involved in the church, right? There you go. You got it. Piece of cake. Question number three, and this is the one that's key. Moses says, what can stop me? What can stop me from doing what you call me to do? Go back up to verse 10 and look at it again. Come and I will send you to Pharaoh that, I'm, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel up? He said, but I will be with you. And this shall be a sign. And he gives the sign back to Moses. It reminds me of Hebrews chapter 1, or chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, where it says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily besets us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him did what? He endured the cross. Was the cross the end? No, that was the means. He endured the cross, despised the shame, and today is sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And what's he doing for us? He's making intercession for us. God says, you don't worry about the details. You follow, I'll take care of it. You follow, I'll take care of it. I'll take care of it. So what can stop you, Moses? Moses, there's only one thing that can stop you from serving me. You. You're it, Moses. Only your desire to serve yourself over God will keep you from allowing God to work through you. 
Moses fretted about all his inadequacies. He begins to spill them out before God. All his issues, all his problems. And God says, that's not a problem for me. What is the one thing that can make me fail today for Jesus Christ? What is the one thing that will close me up? What is the one thing that keeps me from serving God with reckless abandon? What is that one thing for you today? If it's not you, then who is it? It's not God. What is it holding you back? What is it that's causing you to stumble coming out of the starting blocks for Jesus Christ and run the race that is set before you? I think we don't have to look any further than going back to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Listen to what the passage of Scripture has to say. It says this, Now, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again the second, his brother this time, Abel. And now Abel was the keeper of the sheep, and Cain a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of fruit of the ground to God. And Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock, And of their fat to the Lord. And and the Lord respected Abel's offering, but yet he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry. Cain was very angry. And his countenance fell. And the Lord said to Cain, Why are you so angry? Why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, you will... Be accepted, but if you don't do well, you won't be accepted. If you don't do well, sin lies at the door, and it desire it is desirous for you, but you can rule over it. You know what those verses tell us? That in the story of Cain and Abel, there was the, the capability to overcome sin. There was a capability to overcome temptation. There was a capability not to give in, to murder his brother like he ends up doing, right? He murders his brother because God accepted Abel's offering, but rejected Cain's. And as a result, God says at the very last line, and if you do not well, sin lies at the door. What does that mean? Sin lies at the door. And it's desirous of you, but you can rule over it. In other words, there is in our world the sin nature, right? That we're born with. And that sin nature rules our hearts until the Holy Spirit of God intervenes. And God is telling Abel and Cain here, Abel, you did a great job offering up the first fruit, a a lamb, a sacrifice for me. But but Cain, what you're offering to me is good, but it's not what is required for sin. And sin is going to eat you alive if you don't obey God. And you know what? Today... What lies at each of our doors is two opportunities. If you're a Christian, the opportunity is serve God or serve yourself. Serve God or serve myself. And if I serve myself and throw a little bit of religion on there, sometimes I feel good about myself. But God's not interested in a little bit of religion. He's interested in complete surrender. And sin is lurking at all of our doors every day. That's why we're told every day to what? Take up our cross and... Follow him. Moses, every day, had to walk with the Lord. Every day, he had to get up and say, God, I'm not able to do it. And when when Moses finally got a little bit cocky in leadership, what happened? Rather than speak to a rock, what did he do? I'm not going to do it your way today, God. I'm going to do it my way. And watch this. And what was the result? He lost the ability to lead the children of Israel into the land of Canaan. Does that mean God quit blessing him? No. But sin has a consequence. And sometimes what holds us back spiritually is us. And we just need to let go and let God have dominion, have rule, have reign in our hearts and allow him to work through us. I love what God says. So he says, what can stop me? (laughs) Well, Moses, there's one thing that can stop you. Who made your mouth? Who made your mouth? That's what God asked them back. Look with me at verse 11. 
So come and I will show you Pharaoh, verse 10, that he may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that Pharaoh should bring the children of Israel down? And he said, But I will be with you, and this shall be a sign to you. I have sent you, that when you brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve on this mountain. And Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me. And they asked me, What is his name? What shall I tell them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am, sent me. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob will be. He says this, who controls your mouth? I do. This is what you tell them. In other words, Moses is being told this, God, if, if I'm in control of you, Moses, I'll give you what to say. How many are afraid to witness somebody because you don't know what you're going to say? How many times have we had opportunities to share truth with somebody, but we don't do it because we're afraid of what we're going to say? You know what? Moses was too. Moses was like, I'm going to go stand before Pharaoh. What am I going to say? And God says, you're going to say what I want you to say because who made your mouth? I did. Tell him I am who I am sent you. So in conclusion this morning, I believe there's three questions that every Christian must ask. Every Christian must ask these three questions. Number one, who am I in Jesus Christ? Who am I in Jesus Christ? Am I walking and serving him or am I walking and serving myself? Moses, when he was serving himself, said, there's no way I can do this. There's no way I can represent you, God. There's no way I can do what you want me to do. And God says, well, you know who you are? You're mine. That's all you got to worry about. You're mine. I'm with you. We're going to do this together. The second question he says is, what am I called to do? This is a calling that can only be fulfilled by God. It can only be fulfilled by you. You know what? Nobody can be a husband to my wife but me. Nobody can be a father to my children but me. I can try to farm it out to other people, but that's not going to work. That's not going to go right. It's not what God intends. And you know what? Nobody can be called to do what God wants you to do in your place. In other words, the people that you minister to, I can't minister to all of them. But you can. I can't know all the people. and I can't go to work with you every day. And I can't go other places with you. But you know what? You can. And if God is working through you and in you, what are the odds he's going to tell you what to say when you need to say it? It amazes me how many times when I'm talking to somebody about spiritual things, how verses just come back. You try to remember, like, have you ever witnessed to somebody and then somebody uh, later on you're telling them, and you're like, and I shared this verse, I can't even remember what verse I shared with them now. I can't even think of what that verse was. Well, who gave you that verse to start with? Holy Spirit did. You didn't recall it because you're so smart and you're so biblical savvy. You recalled it because the Holy Spirit gave it to you. And because you're using it for the glory of God, he brings to recollection those things you need to know to defend him. If you doubt it, try it this week. Go talk to somebody about spiritual things and watch how verses will just come into your brain instantly because the Holy Spirit gives them to you. I love what verses 11 and 12, and I'm forgetting what psalm it is off the top of my head here. But it says this, So the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes the mute? Who makes the the deaf? Who makes the ones who can see? Who makes the ones who are blind? Have not I, the Lord, made all these? Now therefore go, and I will be your mouth and teach you what you shall say. So the last question today in closing is this. Who can stop you from doing what God wants you to do? Or better yet, who is stopping you from doing what God wants you to do? You see, if God wants you to do it, and God's empowering you to do it, and God wants to do it through you, and it's not happening, then the question is why? Why is it not happening? And what's preventing it from happening, and how can it happen? And God says, when you get in the position of saying you can't, 
then you're getting in a good position because God says, I can. When you say, I won't, God says, well, then I'll find somebody else. But if you say, God, I could, but I need your help, you better hold on because when God gets involved in something, he'll make an axe head float up river. He'll get coins out of a fish's mouth. He'll take a couple loaves and some fish and turn it into what only he can get the glory in. He can make the waves stop. He can make the rain rain. He can make the rain stop. He can control everything in his universe. Everything that he created, he controls. And what are the odds that if we yield ourselves to him, he'll do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think to his glory. So, what can stop you? What can stop me in my tracks today? You know what? It's only my own ambition, my own pride, and my own self that can stop me from doing what God wants me to do. And when I get out of the way and allow God to take over, what happens? He gets involved right away, doesn't he? He is looking not for people who have it all together. He's looking for people who don't have it together, who need him and say, you know what? Here am I. Send me. What is God calling you to do today? Maybe you're here today and you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior. Maybe the decision for you is really the core issue that man has with God himself. Am I going to serve God? Am I going to surrender to God? Or am I going to surrender to myself? And if you're here today and you're at that point in the battle, am I serving God or am I serving self? Then I want you to know that Jesus Christ paid a way He paved a way for you to have access to God where you don't have to go through man, you don't have to go through church, you don't have to go through religion. You can have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ by having direct access to him through the Holy Spirit of God. And he said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him, they place their faith in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. God didn't come into the world to condemn the world. The world was condemned already. He came that they might have life, everlasting life. For the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So how does one get eternal life? Well, it comes through Jesus Christ. It comes through a perfect sacrifice that could take away the sin of the world. And what is that sacrifice? Who could be a perfect sacrifice if man was born in sin, If Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, Adam sinned specifically, for by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so sin is passed upon all people today, all men, because all have sinned. And the real question is, what is sin? Sin is missing God's standard. You ever lied? You ever cheated? You ever messed up? You ever taken credit for something you, somebody else did that you were supposed to do all these things are areas in which we miss god's standard it's called sin we we fall short of the glory of god but you know what there was a man who knew no sin and he became sin for us that we might become the children of god and when we place our faith and trust in him he's not just a man he's god in the flesh for god so loved the world that he sent who his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish eternally separated from god but shall for all of eternity live with christ have everlasting life if you're here this morning and you believe that in your heart and you confess with your mouth the lord jesus christ you know what the bible says according to romans 10 9 and 10 you can be saved and that's what god wants for everybody in this world and you know what what i just gave to you is the gospel the good news, that you don't have to die in your sin. There is a cure for sin, and the cure is Jesus Christ. And the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world did it on the cross of Calvary. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become what? The children of God. You want to become a child of God, then it's as easy as simply surrendering to God. Call on his name, and he will answer you. And he will give give you salvation if we confess with our mouth and we believe in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, then we can be saved. For with the mouth you confess, and with the heart one believes unto salvation.
So if you're here today and you've never received Jesus Christ as Savior, you're struggling in your relationship with Jesus Christ and God, then I'd love to talk with you after the service. I'd love to just have you come up and ask some questions and take the Bible and show you what the Bible has to say about a relationship with Christ. But if you're a Christian and you're here today, the question is this, what's holding you back? What's holding you back? And maybe nothing is. Maybe you're serving God. Then the question is, who are you helping then in their walk for Jesus Christ through discipleship? And I hope that you'll find somebody to invest in and disciple. Let's close in prayer together. Father, thank you for your word. I thank you that it's quick and powerful and sharp as a two-edged sword. And thank you for the skills of the people who figured out how to fix our AC today. And uh, Father, what a blessing it is to, to have some of the most basic needs of life met in such a, a blessing way. And we prayed and, and you answered that prayer today. And we thank you for that. And Father, we just pray this morning that as you motivate us through the Holy Spirit's power, as you push us in our faith, because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And as we grow in our walk with you, Father, I pray that we would see the necessity of complete surrender to you. That God, you don't want to just be part of our life. You want to you want to be consumed. You want us to be consumed with your love, consumed with your grace, consumed with your mercy, so that it overflows out of us and onto other people. And Father, just like Moses didn't think he was adequate, just like Moses didn't know what the mission was, and just like Moses couldn't get out of his own way, God, so many times we're the same way. We know what we should do. We know what could happen. We know what the gospel says will happen. But Father, we never see it happen through us. Because we never get to that place where we let go and let you. And God, help peel our fingers back from ourselves today. Help open our hands to your use. And Father, may it not be us doing it in our power and in our might and in our thoughts. But Father, may it be done in your power and your might and in your thoughts. So you get the glory. In your name we pray. Amen. Lately, it seems that we are getting more and more confused about what a church actually is. So let's take some time to set the record straight. Church is not a building, though a building can be used by a church. Church is not a denomination, though a set of beliefs should be important to a church. Church is not about Sunday, though a church should not forsake meeting together. Church is not about one person or personality, though every church should be pastored. And church is not about size or growth, though every church is called to make disciples. So don't think of church as an address or a location, but rather think of church as mobile and on the move. Don't think of church as something built or planted, but rather think of church as something deployed. Don't think of church as where you are for an hour each week, but rather what you are every day of the week, because the church is the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Feet shouldn't sit still. Hands shouldn't be idle. Feet go. Hands do. This is the church. Church isn't what you're sitting through right now, because you are the church. Now go and be the church.